Historically speaking, video game movies aren't exactly known for their quality, but in recent years, Hollywood has certainly started to take the medium more seriously. Whether that's led to any actual good movies, I'll leave up to you, but regardless, Tinseltown has a habit of making game adaptations with at least one massive goof in and amongst the good stuff. I'm Ewan, this is War Culture, and here are 10 video game movies that made one huge mistake. Number 10. Ruining Nemesis – Resident Evil Apocalypse Pretty much all the excitement surrounding Resident Evil Apocalypse was centred around the appearance of the series' fan-favourite antagonist Nemesis, as was teased at the end of the first movie. But in a true careful-what-you-wish-for outcome, Apocalypse ended up turning Nemesis into a pure laughingstock, enough that many fans ultimately wish the filmmakers never bothered trying. Even if you can forgive how ludicrously cheap Nemesis' makeup, costume, and visual effects all look, the film commits the unforgivable sin of turning the big guy into a big, weak twerp. He's defeated by Alice in a fist fight, and then has a strange late film face turn where he gets himself killed while protecting her from Umbrella forces. Ugh, even knowing this version of Nemesis is Alice's former ally Matt, it all adds up to an embarrassing character assassination that undermines whatever good the movie was doing elsewhere. Number 9. Not Enough Time in the Past – Assassin's Creed on paper, Assassin's Creed should have been one hell of a movie, given that it both starred Michael Fassbender and was directed by the great Justin Kurzel of Snowtown and Macbeth fame. But the film made one pretty huge stinky mistake. It's mostly set in the present day rather than in the Animus, the machine which allows its users to relive their genetic memories. It's like playing the original games, only it's just nothing but Desmond, which would be extremely depressing. Given that the whole modern day storyline stuff is by far the most divisive aspect of Ubisoft's games, it was certainly a choice to set most of the movie there, with only about one third of its runtime actually taking place in the Animus. Like, you had this whole gorgeous medieval Spain setting to use, taking the right option by not doing a straight adaptation of what came before, and then you go ahead and waste it. Why Assassin's Creed? Why? The present day setup just needed to be window dressing for the historical action adventure fair everyone wanted out of an Assassin's Creed movie. Or just better yet, just bin it entirely because that stuff's boring as hell. Instead, the filmmakers got the balance basically totally backwards, ensuring that vast swaths of the movie are a dull, forgettable slog. What a waste of so much talent both in front of and behind the camera. Number 8. Agent 47 isn't bold? Hitman Agent 47 It's certainly more important for a video game movie to nail the essence of its central character than every single physical trait. But come on, how can you screw up Agent 47's bald head? It's right there on every cover. Look at it. It's glaring beautifully. Hitman Agent 47 casts Rupert Friend as the titular assassin, not a terrible choice by any means, and yet for some reason can't even stretch to fully shaving his head. Instead, Friend still has a faint but totally visible layer of hair on top of his noggin, as basically becomes a torturous source of distraction for the entirety of the movie. Now, this is hardly the film's only problem, but more than its slack writing, anemic direction, and mediocre supporting performances, everyone couldn't stop dunking on it for failing to do the most basic of things and just give us a fully bold Agent 47. As any hardcore gamer will know, it's the source of his powers. Number 7. The PG-13 Rating Mortal Kombat 1995 Paul W.S. Anderson's Mortal Kombat is actually a pretty solid effort as early video game adaptations go. It's slick, stylish, boasts a killer soundtrack, and touts top-notch casting for most of its central combatants. The one big problem, though? That dreaded PG-13 rating. I just, look at it, it's just staring at us and mocking us all. Given that Mortal Kombat's chief attribute above all else is its nauseatingly brutal violence, to strip that away for the sake of a more teen-friendly movie was both massively cynical and hugely disappointing. 
This ensured that the plentiful action lacked the eye-popping, gut-wrenching zing of its inspiration. It doesn't fully sink the movie, because there's thankfully plenty else to like here, but Mortal Kombat would have been even better if it featured the grisly fatalities fans understandably expected. Now, somewhat thankfully, this issue was remedied in 2021's reboot, which, while lacking the charm of the Anderson movie and being pretty bad overall, sorry to say, nevertheless made the absolute best of its R rating with some truly gnarly kill sequences. Number 6. Removing Hell! Doom. Even people who've never played a Doom game might be aware that the series is centered around a space marine battling demons from hell. And so, the 2005 movie's decision to jettison the demonic hell element entirely is completely baffling. Instead, the monstrous invasion is the result of scientific experiments gone wrong, a decidedly more generic and considerably less doomy explanation. It's never been explained why Hell was ripped out of the movie, though some fans have suggested that it may have been a budgetary decision. It's far more probable, though, that Universal didn't want to open a big old theistic can of worms by featuring Hell in a movie which could otherwise be marketed more broadly as a horror action flick. Whatever the reason, the absence of hellish imagery leaves a dark cloud hanging over a film that's really only remembered today for that admittedly well executed first-person action sequence. Otherwise, this is stridently forgettable slop from Dwayne Johnson's heyday. Number 5. Letting the director rewrite the script. Max Payne. Of all the video games on this list right for the big screen treatment, few can match Max Payne, which with its hard-boiled film noir inspired tone and balaic John Woo-esque action sequences should have made for an awesome movie. Hell, even Marky Mark Wahlberg's casting in the title role would have been fine if the producers hadn't allowed director John Moore to heavily rewrite both Thorne's script during production. In an interview with Scott Miller, a producer of the Max Payne video games, he revealed that the final shooting script, quote, changed dramatically from the original, and blamed Moore for deviating substantially from the video game's plot with his many rewrites. Given that more of the chief complaints about the film is the utterly snoozy storytelling and characterization peppered in between its stylish shootouts, Moore was clearly in the wrong to start ripping the goods out of the script and replacing it with his own tepid take. Hopefully, the in-development reboot will at least hew closer to the original vision. Either way, as Max Payne fans can look forward to the upcoming video game remakes from Remedy coming in the next few years. Number 4. Casting Jake Gyllenhaal Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time As far as video game movies go, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time isn't too bad, though it is irrevocably stained somewhat by having Jake Gyllenhaal play the lead role, which, to be clear, is a Persian prince called Dastan. Now, that's nothing against Hall's acting chops, but even back in the slightly less enlightened times of 2010, many bristled against the whitewashing of a role clearly better suited to a Middle Eastern actor. It goes without saying that Hollywood would approach casting such a role very differently today, but when re-watching the film, it's tough not to wince slightly at how poorly Hall's casting in particular has aged, and the actor seems to agree himself, saying in a 2019 interview that the role, quote, wasn't right for him. It's a shame, as the bones of a fun swashbuckling romp were there, even if Prince of Persia was hardly perfect outside of its central casting mishap. Number 3. The Huge Exposition Dump Silent Hill 2006's Silent Hill adaptation gets a hell of a lot right. The visual style, sound design, score, and casting capture the atmosphere of the survival horror games near perfectly. It's just a shame, then, that the script can't quite match these other elements, and the film begins to slide off the rails in its third act, culminating in one of the most egregious exposition dumps of all time. 
In an attempt to ensure that general audiences understand the heady plot, the movie literally stops itself dead in its tracks as protagonist Rose has the particulars of a narrative spoon-fed to her on a plate. It's laughably on the nose and basically signifies the screenwriters giving up on attempting to convey the plot in an organic manner. Show, don't tell, as the saying goes, because this boatload of exposition grinds the movie to a talky leaden halt. Other than all of that though, it's actually pretty damn solid, so if you haven't seen it yet, you might want to check it out. Number 2. Miscasting Everyone Borderlands It's almost impressive when a film manages to miscast basically every member of its main ensemble, and that's most certainly the case with Eli Roth's dud adaptation of Borderlands, which is a really, really bad movie. Oh man, where to begin here? Kevin Hart lacks the stature to play the role under the games. Kate Blanchett is clearly having fun, but she's too old to play the Lilith we all know. Jack Black basically just plays himself as Claptrap, and Jamie Lee Curtis seems completely confused every second she's on screen as Dr. Patricia Tannis. Ariana Greenblatt is probably the only mildly persuasive member of the cast, but even then, she's still a pretty far cry from the delightful unhinged Tiny Tina of the source material. Granted, Borderlands isn't particularly well written or directed either, but at least if it nailed the casting of its central characters, it might be a little easier to forgive some of the other filmmaking foibles, of which, again, there are plenty. This truly is a movie where everyone seems like they're acting in a very different but equally bad knockoff of Guardians of the Galaxy. An all-timer in the bad video game movie canon. And number one, the terrible human subplot, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Like its predecessor, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was pretty well liked for the most part, but also like its predecessor, it let way too much human nonsense get in the way. Also, I don't know, I kind of feel like these movies would be better as 2D animations on the lines of Spider-Verse or TMNT Mutant Mayhem, but I digress because they're just not for me and I know some people like them, so more power to you if that's you. But in any case, the sequel doubles down on the whole focusing on humans floor, sidelining Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles for an entire 15 minutes in the middle of the movie to focus on the wedding of Maddie's sister Rachel in Hawaii. The payoff, where Rachel learns that her husband-to-be Randall is actually an undercover gun agent, isn't worth the lengthy build-up, and feels maddeningly out of place in, again, a movie about Sonic the Hedgehog. And so, while the first Sonic film clocked in at a sensibly brisk 99 minutes, this sequel's bloated 122 minute runtime could have been remedied by simply cutting out most of this groan-worthy subplot. Hopefully, the filmmakers won't triple down on it for an impending threequel. Oh well, at least the third movie has Keanu Reeves as Shadow the Hedgehog. That's something everyone can enjoy.